come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven this day and in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. There's no place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. Here in your love, here in your love.
just like you, lion and the lamb, seated on the throne. Mountains bow down, every ocean roars to the Lord of Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but you are one amazing God. You took time to teach us. You took time to show us, and so you gave us three ways to look. The authority of you as a Father who cares about us. But also, as the Son, we needed so much. We needed to be, be fixed, helped taking care of when you took on the cross, you healed us. You brought us home to you. And then you also show us as your spirit, dear God. A spirit that we need to hear how to speak each day and how to learn and grow. But in it all, it's still this just one amazing God that you are. This amazing God. center is the Father. On the 
right hand is the sun And now the spirit moves us onward to freedom
Father. On the right hand is the Son. Now the Spirit moves us onward to freedom. Let's sing this one more time together with the inner Spirit center. In the center.
you dear father we come to you as best we know how but you're the one who teaches us and changes us and shows us dear father we love singing for you but how much better you sing for us because you teach us your voice you teach us in ways that we don't always understand but we love you, we praise you, and we lift it all up in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, there's a corporate promise in God's word. And the corporate promise for each one of us is, whom the sun sets free shall be free indeed. Now, as individuals, God treats us all as individuals within this corporate setting, doesn't he? I don't know what your freedom, what is needed for your freedom. You don't know what's needed for my freedom, but God knows. The corporate promise is, whom the sun sets free shall be free indeed. The individual responsibility rests upon us as we are drawn to him, as we come to him, as we become personal, have a personal relationship with him, this intimacy that we hear so much about with the Father, that's where the freedom comes in each of us. So I want to encourage you, draw close to him. Draw close to him. Because the promise is, whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. What does that freedom look like for you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that you would show us that. Encourage us, Lord God. Encourage us that we can be free in you. Lord, show us what that means for each of us individually, Lord God. Show us where that freedom comes, Lord God. Bring us closer to you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just felt like that need, someone needed encouragement in that area today. So be encouraged. A few announcements this morning. Just want to remind you, next weekend, right after the service, we will be having our, our, church, our ch church fellowship picnic right out here on the front lawns. We'll have our tent set up again, our party tent, and we will party, folks. And uh, yes, <laughs> chicken barbecue with a few dogs. Okay, that doesn't mean we're feeding all of our dogs, no. <laughs> but it will be a chicken barbecue with a few dogs. The church is going to be providing the meat and all that. Jay, I was told this, Jay does not need a sign-up list, so, but please bring the delicious dishes you always bring. Church smorgasbords are the best. <laughs> so we ask that you each bring a dish to pass for our church smorgasbord. Um, it's a great opportunity to invite friends and neighbors. If you want to bring friends and neighbors, this is the time to do that. Bring lawn chairs and games if you want. And also, we're asked to please bring a cooler so we can keep the food in it because we do have limited fridge space. So if you have something that has to stay cold, please bring a cooler to put that in and to keep it in. If you're able to help with two things, set up and tear down, you need to see Fred Thomas in the back there. There's Fred. Fred Thomas in the back. He's in charge of set up and tear down. And if, you're, if you can help with uh, clean up and wipe down, you need to see Janine Thomas, which is right, she's right up front here. So please uh, see them if you can help out in any way next week. This is a family affair. We welcome all, what's it? And we're not setting up the tent at that time. We're just setting up chairs and tables and all that, correct? The, the, the party tent will already be set up. So you don't have to worry about that, that lifting part. So great, eight o'clock, 
uh, next Sunday morning. If you can be here, that would be great. And this is a family time together. So family, bring your friends. We'll have a great time together. Also, a reminder about the pool party coming up on Saturday, uh, August 27th. We are invited to the Sparks' home, Dale and Sarah Sparks' home, for a pool party that day. It starts at 1 o'clock p.m. The meal will be around 4.30. There's a lot of information in the MailChimp. Uh, please see that for directions, see that for what to bring and all that. I'm, I understand that you're supposed to bring a dish to pass, and of course, meat will be provided there. But look for more information in MailChimp on that pool party as well. I also understand that Cynthia Lideline, Cynthia is right up front here, she needs help with some of our landscaping and gardening around here. Um, we, she can't do it alone. And uh, this is our place, this is, uh, we, uh, we own this place, all of us. All of us have a part of an investment in this place. And we want it to look nice for our guests, we want it to look nice for the neighborhood. So I want to encourage you, if you can help us at all out in gardening, uh, that would be great. And please see Cynthia Lideline today. She's right here, she'll be here today after the service. Don't forget to stop and see her and uh, see, what, see what the needs are and see how you can help out with that. I also understand there's a bee's nest hidden someplace in this area. You need to see her for that also if you're going to help out. <laughs> you can see her hand there. <laughs> so please see her for that as well. Um, I believe that's all the announcements that I have. We need to dismiss our children now. So children, if you would stand up. Father, we thank you for these wonderful children. They teach us a lot. Jesus said, let the children come to me. And Father, they are examples to us how to be little children, how to come to you as little children. And so Father, I ask that you would bless them today. I ask that you would keep them. I ask that you would use them mightily for your purposes as they meet together in their own time downstairs, Lord God, that they would grow and learn more of you, that you would be with the teachers that oversee, that, oversee them, Lord God. Give them wisdom, Lord God, and may they grow in friendships as well, Father. We thank you for them. Bless them now as they go in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, you are dismissed, and I want to encourage each of us to stand up, greet one another, shake someone's hand, show a smiling face.
Good morning. Are we on? Can you hear me? All right. Oh, praise God. and you folks will learn how to get along a little better in the future. <laughs> There's something wonderful about fellowship in the Holy Spirit, fellowship in the family of God that you really don't get anywhere else. God loves family, but there is something about the family of God. And uh, I just love being in this church. I love you folks. Uh, uh, as uh, I, I just thank God for Jim. Jim, are you still in here who led worship? Thank you, Jim, for leading us today. That was beautiful. It just really uh, encouraged my soul and lifted me, and I'm so grateful uh, for the word that comes out. You can't lead worship without having the word of God come out, and it was so powerful, and I so appreciate that. And I truly really felt... Uh, Jerry came up to me, Pastor Jerry, former pastor here, and said, don't hold back. If the Lord's been giving you anything, don't hold back. And the Lord gave me a prophetic word as we were in worship, and I really felt I needed to share that with this congregation. I believe the Lord is saying to this people, to this assembly, that he has called you and he has seen your heart. It is it is a reflection of his heart. And the Lord would say, you are my malleable people. You are my clay. And I am grateful for you, says the Lord. And your tears soften the clay that I will form with my hand. And I have a purpose in my mind, says the Lord, that I will form of you a beautiful vessel. I will form of you a beautiful vessel for my glory, says the Lord. So continue to allow yourselves to be malleable in my hands. Let me form you. Let me make a beautiful, uh, a beautiful piece of pottery from you that my name would be glorified, says the Lord. Amen. 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 And so, Lord, we open our hearts to you this day, and we pray, Lord, that you would have your way with us. Lord, have your way Amen. with us in Amen. Jesus' name. Back in uh, December of last year, I brought a message to this church that I titled, Know the Time. And the main theme of that message was that we need to wake up and we need to recognize the times that we are in, especially as it relates to the move of God during this time. Uh, our, our primary duty is to focus on being about our Father's business. Yes. Amen? Amen? We are to be about our Father's business, and the Father's business on earth is about demonstrating His great love, the love of God, and directing people to Him, drawing them to Himself. And we are to work together with Him. If you have received Jesus into your heart and you have made him your Lord and Savior, then he has appointed you. This wasn't your choice, and you might not have known it was part of the deal. He has appointed you as an ambassador of his name. You are ambassador of the King of Kings. You are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. You are a part of that, and you are representing that to the world and to the people around you. And in following up on this, my heart has been uh, to seek the Lord and ask him to show me some ways to encourage the body of Christ uh, to find out about how can we fulfill this calling that you've given to us. And so I, I started, I've started some basic things. I started a website. I call it uh, godsambassadors.net. I did this to help us and uh, to encourage one another 
in, in doing the things that we find that the Lord is calling each of us to do. We all have a unique place to fulfill. You don't have to fill somebody else's shoes. God's got a pair of shoes that are just your size, and you have to fill those shoes, and he will help you do that. And uh, what happened is as soon as I got that done and I was ready to really start moving on some of this, I got sidetracked in this uh, construction project to help somebody get in a home. And it totally sidetracked me. I could not help but listen very closely to Pastor Tim's sermon on uh, the deadly D's. And one of those was distraction. Well, distraction time is over. It's time to get back to business. The Lord has said, start pulling this together. Put that behind you. Pick up the baton again and begin to move forward. Now, the thing is, we continue to face times of unprecedented change. We are seeing change in our culture. We are seeing incredible change in our politics and in the growth of ungodliness in our nation. A nation that was founded on godly principles, but we're seeing more and more. I remember years ago, one of our presidents said, we are not a Christian nation. And he is right. The, pa- the point is, we are Christians. That's right. And I'm not here to talk about political stuff. I'm here to talk about what do we do as children, as citizens of the kingdom of God. That is what the, we primarily need to be focused on. God will take care of all of these other things. So it's disconcerting to face these changes, but you've got to understand the battles that we are facing today are really no different than the battles we faced yesterday, the battles that we faced years ago. How many of here uh, here have uh, uh, salvation? You've been saved for a couple of years. Raise your hand, okay? You faced battles when you first accepted Christ, am I right? You started saying, wow, I'm not what I'm supposed to be. Wow, I need to change. Uh, Does anybody here feel you're done changing? Good, I'm glad nobody lifted their hand. That would have been a whole other sermon (laughs) I wasn't ready for. So, okay, so we need to change. We need to figure out, God, what do you want of us? What is this, this concept of being an ambassador of Christ? What does that contain? What does that uh, sound like? What do we do with that? The, The fact is this world, in this world, the enemy of our souls is rising up and he's making a lot of noise right now. But the God we serve is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? He is still on the throne. Our God is not laying down to take a nap right now, and that's why the enemy's doing what he's doing. The enemy is released. This is his kingdom. This is his his area. But we are not of his kingdom. We are of the kingdom of God. And we must focus our hearts and our minds on fulfilling our roles as citizens of the kingdom of God. We must work alongside the Lord Jesus. Today my heart is to impart a greater understanding of what it is that motivates God. I believe that as we receive and grow in our desire to be motivated by what motivates God, we will be equipped and empowered to fulfill our roles as ambassadors. The first step is that we commit ourselves to forming godly, biblical character into our lives. And I want to, I'm particularly thankful of Pastor Tim, uh, Pastor Jerry, the foundation you've laid in this church. Uh, and we, we see Tim carrying this out that, that he is focusing so strongly on that we would build this godly biblical character into our lives. Without godly character, we would get nowhere. And uh, it's so awesome to be in a church where this is not uh, the responsibility, the pastor does not shirk from the responsibility of training up uh, and teaching us biblical purity and holiness. Now, 
I want you to understand something when I talk about, first off, establishing godly character. We all have character issues, like uh, I just asked, you know, has anybody done changing? We all could use a little changing. We all need to be growing up. We all need to be maturing in God. God is not looking for us. He's not requiring. He never, when you look at how he used the disciples, he did not say, okay, now you guys sit and list. Don't you say a word for three years till I'm done preaching. Don't you, you all just sit down. I mean, within weeks, he says, all right, you guys go out in pairs now and you prepare the way for me. He didn't say get cleaned up first. Okay. We look at, look at Peter. Oh, I feel sorry for the guy sometimes, you know? I, I mean, I, I, he tried so hard, but he's just so human, and uh, he didn't put on airs. And the Lord understands we have flaws. That's okay. God wants to work with us where we are at. It's just like you that are parents working with children. Uh, you that are children working with parents, okay? Um, <laughs> we never quite get away from that, do we? Um, you know, we have to be gracious to one another, recognizing that we need to develop and grow into maturity so that, and, and this is what God wants to do as we develop our character, he will use us through that process. So I, I, I wanted to pause and settle on that for a second because I want you to be encouraged that you are not called to sit still until you feel you've reached some level of maturity. God is saying, do the work today. Let's get going. I'll work on the rest of the things. Also, I want to be careful that we don't fall into this trap of thinking uh, about getting cleaned up uh, where we kind of can fall into this trap of saying, well, okay, I'm so busy, uh, I'm pretty cleaned up now. Anybody who's been saved for a couple years and after a while you've set aside some of the nonsense you were involved in before, some of the wickedness, some of the sin, and you say, well, I, I, I'm doing pretty good now. And Well, I, I go to church too, by golly, and I'm, I'm really pretty, you know, well, maybe I'm not real holy, but I'm pretty holy. And that's, I think that's enough, isn't it? Well, it's really not. Um, don't take your nap yet. I want you to consider Jonah. Now, here's Jonah. He was a good man. By gosh, the guy was even a prophet of God. And he thought he was doing any, pretty good, but the Lord had a specific ambassadorial job for him. I really liked that I came up with that word. I didn't even know it was real, and my spell checker called it. So when you're busy doing the Lord's work, you can just tell people, well, I have some ambassadorial uh, things to take care of right now. And uh, they'll, they'll be impressed, I can tell you. But Jonah had a wrong attitude. Jonah felt that these people he was supposed to be ministering to, to go speak the word to, he didn't feel they were worth the time. He didn't feel they were worth the effort. Why waste his time? But God has a way of getting our attention. And if you want to deal with that, you go right ahead. God will get your attention and show you that there's something that you need to do. When God has called you to do something, I, I was just thinking of this earlier. I, I, in, uh, when I first started to pastor, I met a, a brother from Australia. He was a Bible school teacher. And I told him, I said, well, I'm really... I'm really struggling with preaching the word, all that studying and doing all that stuff. And he said to me in his great Australian accent, he says, well, if the Lord's got his hook in your jaw, his hook in your jaw, what are you going to do? So the fact of the matter is the Lord's got his hook in your jaw. The Lord's got his hook in my job. I cannot shirk because I keep getting, if I shirk, I get jerked. There's something in there that would rhyme. But I, I, the Lord keeps pulling me back into doing what he wants me to do. And the Lord is going to keep on you if you've given yourself to him. Unless you totally turn your back on him, he is going to keep on you to do what you know in your heart you are called to do. God does not want us to just go about and do 
what is right. His first and foremost heart's desire is to see that we do things that flow from who we are and to change us, to get us to understand what motivates him and to incorporate that into our own hearts. Many years ago, my wife and I were sharing our opinions on some things. <laughs> and she had certain opinions about the things I should be doing around the house and carrying. I had my opinion on how I should be doing. And I felt I was doing an awesome job. And I, <laughs> thank you, brother. He didn't even know me, but he knew I was right. I, I, I appreciate this guy. So I finally, I looked at her and I said, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. What else can I do? And she looks at me and she just had this wifely pause. And she said, it's not what you do. It's what you are. And man, I'm telling you, that struck a chord in my heart because I knew I can do stuff. I know how to do stuff when I don't want to. But I am telling you, when my attitude stinks, all of me stinks. And she knew it. Didn't you? <laughs> and the Lord said, Chris, you need a real adjustment because you've got to change something inside your heart that you're doing stuff, but your heart is not in it. And this is how the Lord calls us to praise him and to worship. Don't just do it in word, but we must do it with our hearts. So let's look at what motivates God. Can we put that first uh, verse up? What motivates God? God is love. Love motivates God. God is love. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I want you to consider the first words in there. Beloved, let us love one another. Love is not something that you can demonstrate or do just while you're sitting in your chair, right? I mean, that's nice. Hey, you're a good person. I love you. I, that's great. But love is something that you need to get up and do something with it. It has a manifestation that comes birthed out of what it is. And this is how God is towards us. The Lord created us. He formed us. His love was so great that he then moved uh, and, and gave of himself for us. Uh, it's interesting, as I read that, I thought, I know a lot of people who are not born again. And these people who aren't born again, they often think that they know how to love. And I'm going to tell you, uh, they are often quite close. But you know, you really cannot quite get it and get it right if you're missing the true source of love. There are people that I need to emulate in terms of having a right attitude. But the Lord is the true source of love. All right, let's look at the next verses. Above all else, God is motivated by love. John 4, 9 through 10 says, This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world so that his purpose we can live through him. This is love. It's not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice that deals with our sins. And Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. Christ died for us. We did not draw God down to earth because we were so darn cute and cuddly. Now, some of you, yes, I, I think you're pretty cute and cuddly, but most of us, not so much. His love for us as unsaved sinners was so powerful that it overrode his hatred for sin. God hates sin with a perfect hatred. 
And he looks past that. He was able to look past our sin and to come to us. And this is part of our motivation that has to change. When we think about reaching the lost, when we have a love for the lost, we have got to look past the nonsense of their sin. We must love in the way that he loved. God does not love us because he needs us. He loves us because he is love. It's his nature. It's his character. And he wants it to be our nature, our motivation, our character also, so that we will learn and move in loving our neighbors. Okay, uh, the next verse, Jesus was motivated by the joy that was set before him. Hebrews 12, 2 says, he was, uh, uh, Paul was referring to running the race, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God is eternal. Jesus is eternal. He was there from the beginning, and he will be there to the end that's not coming. It's just going to keep going and going, and he's there. And he has this eternal perspective. His joy over us grew out of the knowledge that he would get to know each and every one of us and be able to spend eternity with us. Is that awesome? I think that's awesome. God wants to spend time with you. He loves watching you grow. He loves watching you mature. Uh, Just like a parent loves watching a child or an aunt or an uncle, whatever, however you fit into the family or a brother uh, or sister, it's just so fun to watch them start to learn something new and do something right. That's how the Lord looks over us. It's very important uh, that when we look at this verse, when it says he was despising the shame, I want you to understand something. Uh, Let's see the next one. Despising the shame, it comes from a Greek word, uh, uh, kataphroneo, as as if you care. Uh, But the important thing is that the Greek lexicon... (laughs) It always sounds impressive, you know. I I could have said supercalifragilistic, but, you know, leaves off the expallidocious kind of thing. But the Greek word, what's important is what it stands for, and that's that it's thinking nothing. It's to think little or nothing of something. So let that settle in your mind. He considered the shame he was going to have to face and he thought nothing. He didn't, when he despised it, I, I, I always had a little trouble figuring out because that reading old King James and then even new King James, that's the term they use. But understanding that he thought nothing of it. I, I, I had to laugh as I, I thought it's kind of like the teenager. Well, some teenagers' favorite word is whatever. Whatever. Why do they say Whatever. It's because they're so focused on their thing and their own thinking that everything else is just whatever. It doesn't matter. So that's a bad application. Do not have that point of view when you're thinking. But you can have that point of view towards the shame of preaching the gospel. The shame that is shame in the eyes of the world. But we must understand we are not concerned about the eyes of the world and what the world thinks of us. We spend so much time worrying about what people think of us, how people look at us. What, you know, are we dressed right? Uh, are we eating the right thing? Are we doing this? Are we doing that? There is one God in heaven one God who came to earth. He is the one we need to be focusing on. Okay, next verse, John 14, 1 through 3. God is motivated by his desire to bless us eternally. To bless us eternally. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. 
Let me just pause on that one. Just think of those words. That's amazing that the Lord said that. Let not your heart be troubled. Whenever I go into something new, I'm always, I get all worked up. And I believe God is calling us into something new as we truly seek him and look at what does it mean to be an ambassador of Christ? What does it mean to reach out to other people? And these words need to settle deep within us. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Why do you think Jesus told us about these mansions? I, I mean, it, it almost seems odd. What? You know, we hear, uh, there's not a whole lot we know about what heaven's like. We, we know kind of like the character, but he started telling us about these mansions. As I looked at this and I thought about the character of God, here's what struck me. God loves family. This is his, he's all about family. And where do families reside? Families reside in homes. I mean, for you moms and dads here, what do you think? Is your home just a house? You know, I mean, sometimes it is, get in the house, okay? I mean, that's a different thing. But usually it's, come on in, manja, manja, time to eat. Come on, let's have some fun. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk together as family. Let's be united. Let's do together. Let's be this united thing called family. And this is what God wants for us. He wants to bless us with that eternally, that where I may be, you will be also. His eternal perspective on that is that he is going to constantly have us there in home with him, enjoying his presence and enjoying each other's presence. John 3.16, is that up there? Yeah. Yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Again, eternal. It's an eternal life. God is looking for this not as a temporary time to spend with him, but he is looking for our eternal and permanent un uh, unity with him and in his family. Now, I want to go into this last uh, section here and this is an area you don't hear preached on a lot I believe in the next verse God is motivated by his concern for our well-being God knows Jesus knew full well what our end will be if we follow our own way and reject him there are over 162 references in the New Testament alone which warn us of hell. Over 70 of these references were uttered by Jesus Christ. The compassion of God, the passion of Jesus, was that we would not spend eternal separation from him. His heart's desire, all of his desire, is that we be with him. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who can say where wisdom begins? The fear of the Lord. Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We do not fear God as we've received him, once we've received him, we continue to fear him for who he is. He's a righteous and holy God. I always knew my dad loved me. I had a wonderful upbringing. I had a dad who loved me. But boy, I'm telling you, I didn't want to push that guy's buttons. And you don't want to push God's buttons. You want to understand your relationship with him and how much he wants uh, to pour goodness out over you. His desire is that you do not perish. 
And here in this verse, he's trying to help us put our fears in order. What should we fear and what should we not fear? I think, I am convinced, we spend way too much time worrying, just like worrying about what people think of us, fearing the wrong things. Fearing the wrong things. Let's uh, get a right understanding and consider uh, when I look at somebody that I know is lost, when I think of a family member that I know is lost, I need to be considering what they are choosing for themselves. They are choosing to re reject the God of the universe. They are choosing to reject their creator, to say that they can do a better job being God than he can, and they can't. And that's our heart. I, even uh, I had these other verses uh, from Mark 90. Uh, 9, uh, verse 43, 45, 47. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. If your foot causes you to sin, if your eye causes you to sin, the things you walk with, the things you work with, the things you see with, your eye gate, the Lord is calling us to be a people of purity, but more than that, he's warning us of the extreme danger. It's out of his heart of compassion for us. You can't make somebody love you. Has everybody figured that one out? We have to, uh, but we can have compassion for somebody and draw them into an understanding of the God who loves them. Many people believe that their concept of good and bad is sufficient to determine who would and who would not go to hell. How many of you have had conversations with people about things like this? Saved and unsaved, okay? Even, even when we're saved Bible reading believers, I think it's hard for us to look at a really nice per person who happens to be a non-believer and to think that they could be facing eternal hellfire. But the reality is, this is what Jesus was specifically warning about. I and we all need to believe Jesus. I did not need to get saved just so that my time on earth was more comfortable. I had condemned myself to, to hell. The unsaved are condemning themselves to hell. Do we love them enough to warn them of the results of their ways? Okay, now as I was preparing this sermon, I realized when I came to this Lord, to this point, the Lord spoke to me and the Lord said, this is where you stop. We need to pray as a people. We need to make an altar and seek God for an understanding of his motivation to impart that to us and put that in, into our hearts. Uh, put that last uh, verse up, will you please? Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. When I consider what God needs to do in us for us to understand how to fulfill our responsibilities to us to be empowered and equipped I know first and foremost we must have hearts that are like his hearts his heart we must find our motivation we must be driven to do what is what we are called of God to do based on the same thing that drove Jesus to do what he did on our behalf. Would everybody stand, please? What I would really like to do right now, that's just to get you up and breathing and moving. I want you to make an altar at your seat right now. If any of you wants to come up here, you're welcome to come up here. This is not a prayer line. This is not to call you to come up for prayer. I want you to seek God right now and ask the Lord to take out the heart of stone. I know he's done this already, but what I believe God is looking for right now is that us as a body of believers, 
do this together and seek God for, to have a true heart for the lost, to truly understand what can we do and how can we do it that God would give us the courage and the wisdom to be able to move ahead in that. So you could all just uh, actually turn around right now and make an altar at your seat if you're able. If, you, if it's hard for you to get up and down, just go ahead and sit down. But if you can, let's just make an altar right here. Uh, and uh, do we have somebody who could just play a little music in the... Okay. All right, let's do this. Go ahead, and if you can, uh, make an altar right at your seat, and we're going to uh, be seeking the Lord now, and let's just ask God to move in us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray, God, give us a heart that is filled with love. Lord, give us a, a heart that will cause us to see the joy that you have set before us, the joy of knowing that our neighbors and our friends and our family will be with us for eternity. Lord, give me a desire to bless, not to look at what is deserved, but Lord, a desire to bless. Change my heart, O oh God, change my heart. Help me to rescue others from an eternal separation from you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to ask Jim to play for uh, a couple more minutes while you meditate on these words and on what God is calling to you. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came for us in all of our imperfection, in all of our rejection of you. Lord, you came for each one of us. Lord, help us, teach us. Give, our, give us hearts that are motivated as your heart that we would go to others who are likewise rejecting you, casting you aside not thinking of you, but Lord, if in some way, whatever way you can show us, Lord, how to share the love of God. Lord, help us set aside. Help us to think nothing of the shame. Help us to think nothing of the embarrassment in the eyes of the world. Lord, thank you for the glory of your kingdom that you have put inside of us Lord I pray for your blessing over this people your anointing over them I pray for a fresh wind to fill their 
hearts and their spirits, Lord, that their minds would be set free, that they would be set free from worrying about things that are of no concern. But Lord, that they would look to you continually, looking to you, the author and finisher of their faith, and that they would be encouraged and equipped, Lord God, in every way, in everything that they need to move ahead. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about some of the ideas, some of the things, uh, a few more on this uh, idea of being ambassadors, and then I want to really be looking. I want people to have, uh, come with your ideas. Come with your ideas of different things that you could be doing and how to share the gospel. Like I say, God's got a shoe that fits you perfectly. And uh, sometimes just pointing other people and saying, hey, we're going to try this, we're going to try this. God will open doors for us that will shock us if we only listen to them and respond. Amen. God bless you.